Hi, everyone. Wow, this is, you guys are the main event of everything that happened for the last, you know, 50 years. And uh, this is the world's chance to thank you and for you to re-encounter each other. Uh, it's, it's one of those 50th reunion deals. But well, what's neat is that only a few of us are dating back the whole 50 years. And so it's also a multi-generation thing. And I'm just riffing away here. How long am I supposed to do this? <laughs> okay, so after the five minute talks, which will go on from now until about 3.15, uh, we want to get a photograph of basically all of the, of the, all of the alums, all the veterans, all the people who worked uh, with Whole Earth and Point in the well in the Hackers Conference. Yes, I'm going to turn this over to Howard Reingold, incredible Whole Earth veteran and well organizer and everything else. Over to you. All right, thank you. So these are lightning talks, and um, I've been given the job of making sure that everybody sticks to five minutes. So I'm gonna jump up here and give a very brief intro for everyone. And then um, at the five minute mark, I will give a polite little honk. <laughs> if it goes on longer, we get the gong. And if the gong doesn't work, I will come up on stage and, and hug the speaker until they leave. <laughs> okay. So let's start with Larry Brilliant. New Stewart since, oh, I should uh, put my glasses on so I know what I'm doing. New Stewart since 1969, was on the bus with the Hog Farm Commune, helped eradicate smallpox, with World Health Organization, co-founded Save a Foundation, and sweet-talked Stewart into being his partner to start the well. He headed Google.org, Skull Foundation, and Salesforce.org. Larry? I'm gonna begin at the beginning, I'm gonna go to the end, then I'm going to come back to the middle, and I'm going to stop when five minutes to stop. So look at this picture, apart from the obvious all white men. <laughs> now, that just means that we are a, a, a historical accident, a brief period of time, because, of course, Ryan and Gerija should be in this, and Gail Williams, where's Gail? Gail is going to follow me and tell you the truth about the well. <laughs> But take a look at this. And when I look at this, I try to understand the origins of the well, and I see the Merry Pranksters, and the hog farm, and the farm. I see communes, and ashrams, and bus trips across the world. I hear a moment in time when we explored everything, yearned for truth, and wound up creating magic. So today you can sign on to the well still. Gail's going to tell you about that. You can still use it. It's still living. It's still alive. If you open it up, you will not see what you see when you sign on to Facebook or Twitter. You will see you use your own name. You own your own world, words. You may own your own world, too. That was one of Stuart's great contributions. You own your own words. No advertising. Pay as you go, subscription based. Stuart and Howard and Kevin and Cliff and Tex and Matt and Gail and others who built the well were magnificent. They created a legend. They showed us the right way. I do sometimes wonder if those of us who were there at the beginning, the early days of the internet, Vince Cerf was my advisor. <laughs> no web yet. Hayes, 300 broad loans. <laughs> Could we have altered the trajectory? I think of the time when it was the source, CompuServe, the Well, Genie, MySpace, Friendster, Facebook, and I don't know that that sentence ends there. 
Don't we need a new name to add to that list? Maybe the welcome back. Okay, how much time do I have left? Two minutes. Um, I'm going to give you some anecdotes on what paved the way. We all have our well stories. How many of you have a well address, ever had a well address, ever used the well? Still have. <laughs> I tried to. I couldn't remember my password. So, all right, really quickly, I met Stuart in 69. You heard that already. My memories of Stuart were a kaleidoscope, the hunger show, the star of in Earth People's Park in Norton, Vermont, the last left-hand turn in the United States, and I remember introducing him to David Crosby. Hippies were popular. Warner Brothers made a movie. Wavy and Ja and my wife Gerridge and I were in that movie. It ended with a Pink Floyd concert in Canterbury. We bought two new buses, and we drove to Nepal. We lived in India for 10 years. A lot of that was in an ashram with Neem Karoli Baba and Ram Dass and Steve Jobs, who got there too late. By then, I had been sent to go work in the smallpox program. One day, Steve showed up at the World Health Organization and said he wanted lettuce. He liked veggies. I gave him a meal at the WHO cafeteria. Years later, when it was at my house in Ann Arbor, I showed him something called Save a Talk a rudimentary computer conferencing system that I used to put all the SEVA organizations together. And then I asked him for money for SEVA, and he said, you see what you have there? Take your own fucking technology, make your own fucking company, make your own money, then fund your own fucking charity, and I'll help you. <laughs> and he did, and I took that company public, and we had $7 million when I saw Stuart and Ryan at WBSI in San Diego, they were going to go skinny dipping. Ryan said to Stuart, we can go skinny dipping anytime, but let's have lunch with Larry. We did, and we talked, and that's apocryphal, but it's true, and we wound up creating the well. Good. That's it. That was the middle. I gave you the beginning, the end, and the middle, and now Gail's going to give you the truth. <laughs> Great. Um, Colleen is going to give the one-minute warning. Yeah. So, Gail Ann Williams first slid into the whole Earth orbit when her librarian mom brought home a copy of the first catalog, but it wasn't until 1990 that she logged into the complex community blossoming at the well. Soon, Gail took on tending that curious place, and then after more than two decades, she shepherded the transition to a group of community members who own and manage the well today. Thanks, Howard, and thanks, Larry and Stuart, for being our founders. Um, I guess this is one of those times when all you can do is say, uh, is anybody here from the well? <laughs> and that, that line, sort of legendary in well circles, uh, Evie Pine, who I believe may be here today, uh, at, one, at one point was at a local event and stood up on a table and yelled that out, is anyone here from the well? And people loved that so much. People are still telling each other that tale on the well now because we are, we're from a place. We know we're from the well. We know that the well is a place made of our words that we, that we contribute each day, but it definitely has got a location. And it probably, really probably it has a, Hobbit homes and yurts and things, but it was easier to put some words into a, a, a city environment. And everyone who logs in must be seeing the place differently. That's part of what gives it its sizzle. So I'm thinking about all the different stories over the years at the well. It comes back to that, that, uh, that slogan that is also an acronym, yo Yao, you own your own words. So this... This is uh, one of Stuart's contributions that is a terms of service statement that turned out into sort of a Cohen. It, people turn it around and they look at it from all different angles and, and, and how do you own your words and are you your words and are you owning up to your words? 
And there's a certain private property sort of component and a desire to control what you put out in the universe. But I think the most important thing is that when you're weaving your words in with other people each day, you're making a collective that's really owned by all of you and that is culture. And that to me was the most exciting thing is realizing that the well was its own place and that in many ways the people who log into the well even just to pick up their email are, they feel ownership because they're, they're contributing the words. And over the years being in management, having an interface with the people who take on the real nitty gritty struggles of actually being ownership and being in an ownership group and wondering why these people are pissed off that you think they're owned. It's, it's been a, a really an interesting, strange story all the way along. I'm so grateful for everyone at each stage who took that on, all the people who took on the peculiar role of being on the staff where you're, you've got one foot in the, in the conversation where how could anyone possibly own this magical thing? And the other foot in the business reality of like, we've got to keep it going, a platform lives on a planet that's real. So it's been quite the adventure. I think one of the most interesting word stories to me is about beams. And beams are something that people invented on the well, living in a place made of words that has no words. Sometimes there's, uh, there's something that's so profound or so traumatic and troubling that you can't really think of anything to say in response. And so the custom was created to leave a blank post. And it seems weird, but if you've ever asked for beams or received beams of support, it feels like white light ro rolling over you. It feels like a, a song with no words. It's amazing. This still goes on today. I looked last night, people were, were offering beams to each other for all kinds of difficult situations still. I want this to continue. Um, words, words and wordlessness can be tools in the context of a place made, made of words. Um, use your words can mean use the most powerful tools we've got. And people on the well have obviously done things like start organizations, uh, electronic Frontier Foundation is a great example of that. Uh, people have been gotten married and started businesses and had gone on vacations and had picnics, but they've also done barn raising and helped someone who sometimes didn't even ask for help, helped people, for example, a single mother whose daughter got into private school and, and she couldn't afford the college tuition and suddenly there was a barn raised scholarship. And in another case, there was a, a terrible medical situation in a third world country and people barn raised the strategy and money to bring someone home. And so just to, just to wrap up, I, I think of the well and I think, let it continue, let the words continue, let the platform continue, and let the planet that supports the platform continue. Thank you. Next up is Will Marshall of Planet. Planet has launched the world's largest fleet. Uh, Will's not here today. Oh. The co-founder is here. Oh, and. Robbie. Okay. <laughs> Robbie is going to speak about Planet. Planet has launched the world's largest fleet of satellites to image the entire Earth every day. The next project using AI to index all the objects on that imagery, ships, trees, houses, roads, planes, over time. The goal to make the Earth searchable the same way Google makes the internet searchable. We'll, um, you'll, uh, Robbie um, will briefly share a vision for how this database can become a living record of the immense physical changes happening across the globe. You can't fix what you can't see. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, that was a wonderful overview of Planet, but what I think is, uh, is very important is to talk about information, uh, community, and a movement, because uh, that is what, uh, what has been created here for generations, and it continues as we take a look at that timeline. 
uh, moving forward. So first off, the timeline in the back is, is the blue marble. It's the image of, uh, of the, the Earth. Uh, one of the things that came back from the Apollo astronauts in the Apollo program was discovering home and how fragile our home is and how interconnected we are as a species and with the environment around us. And also in that year, NASA launched a satellite called Landsat. Um, and uh, that program has been continuous for the last 45, 47 years, imaging the whole world every two weeks. So we've been able, and all this data is open. It's available for us all to see change over time. And every two weeks, for about 45 years, we see cities grow, we see forests shrink, we see our ecosystems change. And that information is very valuable for climate scientists and for scientists to understand change over time. But it, it, it doesn't seem to be enough for us as a species, as a society, to live sustainably on our home planet. And uh, so about six or seven years ago, um, actually about 20 years ago, I met my community at a UN conference. Uh, similar to the communities that are created and developed here in order to come up with projects and ideas and finding leverage points in society that will then have a ripple effect through. Um, and, uh, and have devoted my, my life and career and passion to building systems that actually leverage space. And a lot of that is the unique nature of space, what you can do in there that you can't really do here. Uh, and it's all about helping using space to benefit humanity. So after working at NASA for about uh, 10 years, Will and I and another good friend, we left NASA to start Planet, seeing a convergence of both technology uh, as well as people and purpose to come up with a mission uh, that we direly need on our planet, which is how can we better become stewards of our home? How can we responsibly enable a transparent planet and access to tools so that we can anticipate what's about to happen and get out in front of it and steer us through this century? And, um, and six or seven years later today, uh, as mentioned, we've, we've launched and operated all from here in San Francisco, by the way. We have a, a mini space program in downtown uh, San Francisco, um, the world's largest constellation of satellites in history. We have 150 satellites in space, and you can see in this animation here how that works to image the, the whole world every day. It, it effectively creates a line scanner for the planet. And um, over the last three years, we've been doing that every week. And over the last year and a half, we've been doing that every day. We have a picture of everywhere on the planet 700 deep for the last three years. When you put a bunch of computer vision and machine learning and math against that, uh, then we're able to understand what's happening. And in fact, create a bit of a, a living history of the planet. So our future selves in five years from now can query back through and try to understand the complexity, the, the, the interconnectedness of, of what we're doing to our planet. Because it's our home. It's our home. And we are terraforming it without insight into where we're going. And so it's, it's, our, it's our hope that uh, we can activate this data and create the tools to make it usable for all of us individually as citizens, as denizens of planet Earth as well as in society so that we can get toward a truer cost economic system to get some rent seekers out of the economy with great transparency, de-escalate conflict to then allow for nation states around the world to have access to the same information to not assume the worst, uh, and then ultimately um, have insight into where things are going so that we can find these leverage points in society and, and, and become good stewards of the earth. Thank you. Diana Hadley is an environmental historian, former cattle rancher, now director of a wildlife reserve in Mexico, and was Peter Warshall's partner for almost 30 years. So this is, this is very humbling for me to be here and to try to talk about Peter and his relationship with Whole Earth because it was so important in his life. And I want to tell you, he's been gone for five years. He died of cancer in uh, 2013. 
and um, he still has a well address. So if anybody wants to write to him, you just go to pwturtle at well.com. We'll see if he answers. In any case, um, Peter, Peter's life with Whole Earth was an embodiment of ideas and concepts that he really generated and shared and just reveled in the camaraderie that he had with everybody else who worked at, with Whole Earth. And uh, he was the last editor of the um, many incarnations of the Whole Earth magazine and totally enjoyed doing that. In addition to working with Whole Earth, he also had other consulting jobs that took him all over the world. And so he traveled from Sausalito to the Vatican to fight for um, Mount Graham red squirrels and Apaches. And he traveled throughout all of the Sahelian um, countries that were suffering from devastating desertification during the 80s and 90s. He was in Chile and, and Guyana doing work for the biosphere. And he had a very, very exciting life. Many of his jobs involved um, fights with agencies, and that's why I call this talk the questions that Peter asked, because he very often would start out a project by delivering a letter that had a series of very pointed sequential questions with a request for um, an answer to each one of these questions in order by a certain date. And it used to scare the shit out of governmental agencies, and it really worked. And so it was something that I strongly recommend to anybody who is in the same kind of situation with trying to minimize the damage that we're doing to the um, planet. In any case, I looked through um, some of Peter's uh, comments that he made for the 20th anniversary um, of the whole Earth. And in that year, he talked about the interdependence of all creatures. And he talked in, in, uh, during the 30th reunion um, of Whole Earth, he talked about uh, poaching as a metaphor of uh, the damage that is being done and how dangerous acquiring your food can become. Um, and he talked about the deep hunger in America that was for new stuff that wasn't taught by academic organizations. Um, in that same year, the 30th anniversary year, he wrote something that I think is his really most important um, essay, and that is Finding Your Animal Ally. And this is a quote. Find a non-domestic animal that moves you in some vivid man manner, a teacher, a friend, an ally, what used to be called a totemic ally, a totemic animal. If you follow the life of that animal, learn all you can possibly learn about it, you will become connected to the whole earth. And then he said, if you have that ally as a friend, you will never be lonely. Um, in any case, I, Ryan suggested that I talk briefly. How, do I, how much do I have left? A minute and 20 seconds. OK. The legacy that he left to me personally are three different projects. One was called Dreaming New Mexico, which was a plan for a reformation of all of the energy systems of the state of New Mexico and the agricultural delivery and production systems. And that led into a thing called Mission Gardens, which is an area across the street from our house in Tucson, which archaeologists discovered was the longest continually farmed area in the United States, the first place that corn came to in the US. And we have turned that very successfully. He prevented it from being plastered over by um, a, a, a widened freeway. And since that time, we've turned it into the first living edible museum of agricultural history in the US that con continues, has a continuum of of uh, pre-contact agriculture from 4,100 years ago to the agriculture of the future. And the final one is the Northern Jaguar Project, which we established together, which is a reserve in northern Sonora, Mexico, for the critically endangered jaguar species. And since that time, we have turned it into a 75,000 acre core reserve with an 80,000 acre periphery of working cattle ranchers in which the ranch owners 
sign contracts with us to support the presence of living predators, including jaguars. And that's been an incredibly successful project. This picture, which I can't see, but I think I sent in one of uh, Peter talking to two of his step-grandchildren. He loved teaching, and he loves the teaching. I'm sure that he still loves the teaching that we're doing in Mexico, converting a whole new generation of young Mexicans into stewards of the planet. Thank you. Next up is Orville Schell. Orville Schell is a writer, academic, and activist known for his works on China, and is the Arthur, Arthur Ross Director of the Center on U.S.-China Relations at the Asia Society in New York. He previously served as Dean of the University of California, Berkeley Graduate School of Journalism. I think everyone in this room, in some measure, is the progeny of the Whole Earth Catalog and all of the other institutions that sort of spun off from it, uh, like the Coevolution Quarterly, the Well, uh, Global Business Network. And I think if, as I look back, the one thing that it really did imbue me with was a deep and abiding sense of the way in which things are connected. And uh, that, of course, uh, is metaphorically speaking, represented nowhere more I think uh, more keenly than in the whole notion of climate change, that we're all in this damn thing together. Um, I think you see a picture there of a glacier. That is a glacier, the Concordia and the Baltoro Glacier near K2 and the Karakoram and the um, uh, Greater Himalaya Range. And why did I want to show you this? Because what you see there are what are literally rivers of ice. And out of that river of ice comes the Indus River. But out of the area from which these glaciers reside, and they're magnificent, and we long thought of them as utterly immovable and eternal, uh, rise every single major river system of Asia, on which several billion people depend, on which every single major civilization of Asia has arisen. And, of course, now, they're all being deranged, being disturbed by elevated temperatures and climate change. Think of the consequences of that. That downstream, we have the Indus River going through Pakistan, then India, then Pakistan, the lifeblood of that country. And if India and Pakistan start building dams, if the river starts diminishing in its flow in certain times of year, you can imagine the consequences. And so that consciousness that we are all somehow in this together and what happens to that river doesn't just depend on what the Indians and the Pakistanis do. It depends on what you do. It depends on what I do. It depends on what China does. It depends on what America does. And yet here we are in a world where these two big countries, the largest carbon emitters in the world, are increasingly at loggerheads. The one thing we agreed upon during the last presidential administration was that we should collaborate on climate change. That piece, that keystone of the common arch of US and China was pulled down by our present president. And the relationship is now left to founder. How are we going to remedy this problem? How will these glaciers, which it turns out are not so imperturbable, are not so eternal, what's going to happen to them in the future? And again, they are a kind of a metaphor for the larger question of all the different kinds of derangements around the planet that are now happening because of our profligate use of uh, energy, particularly fossil fuel-based energy. And so, I find, you know, I never imagined back in the good old days when we were just beginning to get that first inchoate sense of the planet as whole and looking at Earth and thinking we're all in this together. It never dawned on me that we would ultimately find a way to, to 
disturbed its very operating system, not just a piece of it, but the fundamental core of it. And that is, alas, what we have done. So that we look at these mountains, this area where we once thought the Tibetan Plateau was of no consequence really to anybody. It was just a big white place on the map. And now we see it is connected. Indeed, everything is connected to everything else just at a time when the world is becoming less connected in this so-called globalized world where it seems that centrifugal forces between countries are much more extreme than the forces that are bringing us together. And so look at that beautiful glacier, think about its future, think about its consequences, and you may uh, wonder uh, what is to be done and how are we to proceed. And I would have to say, at this particular point of history, I don't see a remedy. And that is a fairly gloomy and a very, fairly disparaging thought. But I think this is a time of extremity and a time of uh, extreme consequences to which somehow we all have to seek to rise. So with that rather gloomy thought, I will leave you. <laughs> Next up is Isabella Kirkland, who is trying to document as accurately as possible species of plants and animals we are likely to lose during the Anthropocene, analog in oil so that they may outlive the species themselves. And I quote Isabella here, I had the dumb luck to get a job at CQ late in 1976 stuffing envelopes. I stayed for four and a half years. I attribute the better part of my higher education to those years of proofreading CQs and a good portion of Stewart's library. Um, it's so wonderful to see all these people here in one room. It's great. Um, I had the dumb luck when I was 21 years old in 1975 to get a two-week temporary job stuffing envelopes. That turned into what I call uh, my college education. So I stayed for four years, and I learned more there than I learned in any university. Um, getting to just proofread articles from the enormous wealth of thinkers involved in the catalogs, in the magazines, over that period was a, a profound education. Um, I have to say that Peter Warshall is probably more responsible for anyone else in directing my life now. Um, when I first came to CQ, uh, the mailing list was on in cardboard boxes, like shoe boxes with a spindle card. I wish I'd stayed with that. I helped turn it over to a computer system of mailing list. And uh, I would, we would find weird bugs, of course, in the operating system, and I learned I have very good pattern recognition because I could always solve them, or most of the time solve them. Um, but Peter would come in with some, what was turning in work or meet at a meeting or something, and he would just tell one small story about how the Mount Graham red squirrel, what it needed to survive in its place. And I would find myself thinking about it for a month afterwards. And it's been said many times today, and I'm sure it will be said again, how deeply connected everything is. Um, I, I think that just the concept of systems thinking maybe was born at Whole, at Whole Earth that e there's so many different kinds of systems. There are ecological systems, mechanical systems, uh, social systems, and they all operate in this interconnected way where each piece is essential to the function of the whole. So what I decided to do with that after flailing around in New York City um, and getting my graduate degree as part of John Brockman's Reality Club, um, uh, is decide to try to paint what we're going, what we're losing. Uh, so I work as accurately as possible, as scientifically as possible, and make these old Dutch-looking still lifes. Anne Herbert said everything matters, and I'd have to say that 
in my work, what I see is that every species matters in exactly the same way. You can't lose sometimes a fly that you can barely see with the naked eye because some flower relies on the pollination for that fly and the flower feeds some bats and some birds. It's all so intensely connected. So with that in mind, my next big project is working with a woman named Sarah Hurdy, um, anthropologist at Davis, wrote the book called Mother Nature. Uh, she and I are building the substance of the next piece I'm doing. It's to be called Father Time. And that is about animals where the males do a predominant part of baby care, um, including the Dayak fruit bat that lactates, the only male that lactates in the mammal world that we know of, and also um, a, a rodent that manages to keep track of how much time he spends with four or five or six different females and then apportion his parental care based on how many times he mated with that individual. So he has to keep track of it somehow, which is really interesting, you know. Um, but it is, it is just the fact that every single species matters that drives the work I hope to continue doing for the next 20 years. Thank you. Hey. <laughs> next, Ken, Ken Dykewald. Uh, Ken Dykewald, PhD, is a world-renowned gerontologist, psychologist, author of 16 books, documentary filmmaker, and the founding CEO of AgeWave. However, as a high-minded but relatively dazed and confused 24-year-old Esalen expat in 1974, Stuart Brand impacted his life in ways that neither would have imagined. Um, first, I don't get a chance to be here with royalty, so wavy gravy. We're all honored to be here with you. Yeah, so mine is a slightly different story. I think I'm sort of the distant but deeply ingrained member of this tribe. Uh, I uh, had finished up at Esalen in 1974. I was 24 years old, and I came to Berkeley because of the extraordinary woman on the left, Gay Luce. Uh, and her extraordinary partner and collaborator, Eugenia Girard. And we had this idea that we would, could create conceivably a new model of medicine and psychology and maybe even humanity. Uh, we were young and high spirited, a little bit foolish, very hungry. Uh, we had no funding. We really didn't know what we were doing. Uh, and we found out that we were joined by some other folks, Len Duell, Ken Pelletier, Eric Pepper, Stanley Kellerman. Um, Eric Erickson, Joan Erickson, his wife. And the idea was that we needed to create something in order to function. Gay had this friend, Stuart Brand, uh, who was kind enough to give us $5,000 so that we could organize ourselves into a not-for-profit. By the way, Stuart didn't realize this until a few weeks ago when I told him this whole story. We didn't have a name. Names are interesting. So we made up a phrase, holistic health. We called ourselves the Holistic Health Council. That phrase caught on, the field caught on, thanks to Stuart. We then became the SAGE Project. And what then began for me has been a 45-year journey to try to understand how we're going to make something of ourselves if we live longer and longer lives. So first point, if not for Stuart and the Point Foundation giving us $5,000, holistic health would not have happened as it did. The SAGE Project would not have happened as it did. Uh, I wouldn't be here right now in this role. So over the last decades, partly spurred by the spirit of the Whole Earth Catalog and the vision of people like you, uh, I tried to dive deep into some of the issues of this subject. And one of the things that struck me was that throughout 99% of human history, the average life expectation worldwide on this planet had been under 18. So there have been some 40 and 60 and 80 year olds, but not very many. But during the 20th century, due to extraordinary breakthroughs in medicine and refrigeration and such, we began to elevate the life expectancy throughout the world. But we don't have a notion for that. The chairs you were sitting on were designed for the body of a 22-year-old man. You probably have already noticed that. <laughs> the auditory range in these sound systems are designed for the ears of people who are under the age of 30. 
our automobiles, the length of time it takes for this traffic lights to change, geared to the swift movement patterns of the young. 95% of all the doctors and nurses practicing in medicine in America today have not taken one elective in geriatrics. We do not have a model for maturity. We've not built a medical system for longevity. We do not have a concept of who we can become. So who will I be when I'm 60, when I'm 80, when I'm 100? I uh, was lucky enough to do the commentary for CNN when John Glenn announced he was going to be going up into space at 77. And the young reporters were kind of poking at him. Don't you think you're a little old for this? And he returned to the reporters face on and he said, hey, just because I'll be 77 doesn't mean I still don't have dreams. So one of the issues in front of us is to what do we make of ourselves in this longer life? I would tell you that um, there's a lot of questions in this. I welcome all of you. Uh, so 16 books, two and a half million people in presentations later, uh, lots of discussions, lots of nights not sleeping trying to figure this out. Uh, I'm here to say that I pay tribute to Stuart Brand and you folks at the Whole Earth Catalog. I was 18 when we saw our, saw our first picture of the Earth from apart. And in my view, that was the most powerful meme of our life. The idea of a Stanford graduate, an army person, a psychedelic head, a photographer, a photographer, an artist, building a notion as to what the world might be and seeding Silicon Valley, of course, beginning with Haight-Ashbury, seeding our modern music, seeding our technology revolution, seeding a whole way of thinking. This is a singular man, and I am very grateful for the chance to come back 45 years later and say thank you. Peter Schwartz gets the award for giving me the shortest intro. My intro is 40 years of collaboration with Stuart. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, uh, and actually, special thanks to uh, Howard and Art Kleiner, wherever you are. Uh, I know you're out there somewhere. Uh, uh, the only good book I've ever written, The Art of the Long View, is a good book because of Art and Howard, who helped me write it. Uh, uh, the theme of my uh, talk is called Not Killing Whole Earth. Uh, I, I first encountered uh, this community uh, when I was still an astronautical engineer and saw the first image of Whole Earth, thanks to Stuart, and began to change my life. I first actually met Stuart uh, at UC Davis when I first moved out to uh, California, uh, where I was working in student housing with my old friend Harvey Stone over there, who later ran the Whole Earth truck store. It's all totally uh, intimate. Uh, and uh, when I met Stuart, he doesn't remember this, of course, uh, he came up for an event and we boffed. Now, how many of you remember boffers, right? Well, what you don't know is what a vicious boffer Stuart was. None of this peace and love boffing. He made you feel it when you got hit by Stuart with a boffer. Uh, but that was my first encounter with Stuart uh, it, back in 19, it must have been about 1971, 72. Uh, but really, this story begins with a particular party, which many of you will remember, the Demise Party, right? How many of you were at the Whole Earth Demise Party? Uh, still a fair number of survivors who were there. And why was there a Demise Party? Stuart was trying to kill the Whole Earth catalog. It wouldn't die. This was an idea that was just too big, and it just wouldn't die. So we had, he threw this party not far from here at the Palace of Fine Arts, uh, and took some of the profits, handed it out. Everybody was going to take all the money, and then all, some of it came back. It was a, one of these iconic events that endures as a remarkable moment in time. But he failed because he couldn't kill it. It kept coming back with later editions. And then came, of course, the uh, Whole Earth Review and Coevolution Quarterly. And that's where Stuart and I first really began to co collaborate. I wrote a column uh, under a pseudonym in uh, uh, CQ and Whole Earth. Uh, still couldn't kill it. Well, he tried. He shut down the, the journal. And uh, uh, Stuart and Ryan were passing through London on their way home from Africa. And I was uh, then at Shell in London, and we got Stuart and Ryan came to stay with me. And he said, you know, I'm really interested in how complex systems learn. And I said, well, so are my colleagues at Shell. So we created the learning conferences. The whole earth just wouldn't stop. Uh, then I left Shell, and we said, well, what are we going to do now? So we created not the whole earth business network, the obvious alternative, but the global business network, whole earth 
still wouldn't die. And there are many, many whole earthies here, I mean, uh, GBNers here that I see like Lawrence and others around the room that were all part of. The picture that I was trying to show was the first actual uh, meeting of the Global Business Network. Orville's in that picture. Peter Warshaw is in that picture. There are many, many Lawrence Wilkinson is in that picture. And there's a whole bunch of you out there that were in that picture with us at the very first meeting of the Global Business Network, where we took the vision of Whole Earth to the world of business all over the planet. And we had people from all over the world. Well, of course, we started GBN on the well. And so the well was an important part of that story as well. Uh, then out of that came, of course, the Long Now Foundation. Whole Earth still wouldn't die. Long Now is, of course, the natural successor of what it all uh, was done. And then, of course, the clock of the long now, uh, and it still won't die. And then, of course, there was another thread that actually became out of this, another seed that uh, bore flowers, and that was, of course, Wired. There's a number of Wired folks out here. And there's the odd coincidence that, of course, this is also the 25th anniversary of Wired, which is being celebrated in the next few days as well. Whole Earth still wouldn't die. All right, so then, okay, the clock, long now, GBN, and now it's revive and restore. Whole Earth still won't die. Now he's actually trying to transform the species of the planet. So it just keeps on going. It just won't die. And in fact, only a few weeks ago in this facility, Orville uh, curated and put together an amazing exhibit. You saw a picture of coal and ice of a remarkable event that Orville and I and Jerry Brown and others all participated in that was all about climate change. Whole Earth still wouldn't die. So it just kept on going. Uh, and by the way, uh, I'm, I'm going to show you a pair of shoes. You've seen Howard's jacket. Make sure you look at his shoes. Uh, but uh, coal and ice was really about not killing the Earth, really, not killing the whole Earth. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm wearing a pair of shoes made by Adidas uh, that are 10 plastic bottles brought from the ocean each. Uh, that's whole earth. Um, it is, I'm wearing a pair of socks from conscious, shoe, conscious clothes, all about saving the oceans. That's whole earth. So the question I want to leave you is, what seeds will we continue to plant that will keep whole earth alive, that won't let Stuart kill whole earth? Thank you. And that, that photograph and uh, the Demise party are, are both in the, the video that Fabrice Florin has created, and I urge people to see it. It's going to be showing on the hour um, in, in the gray room back there. It's, it's 40 minutes long. It's really remarkable. Uh, so next up is, um, where did I put my glasses? Uh, Ariel. Eventually, I got to find him. Ariel Ekbla is the founder and lead of the MIT Media Lab Space Exploration Initiative, a team of over 50 students, faculty, and staff actively prototyping our sci fi space future. Ariel is simultaneously completing a PhD in aerospace structures. Her current, in Dr. Joseph Paradiso's Responsive Environments Group. Her current research, inspired by Buckminster Fuller and themes from the Whole Earth Catalog, explores self-assembling space architecture for future space tourist habitats and space stations in orbit around the Earth and Mars. Thank you so much. It's a delight and a real honor to be here talking to all of you today. I'd like to tell you a little bit about the space initiative, some of our mission and themes, and this particular interest in self-assembly and how it relates back to Whole Earth, Bucky Fuller, and this tradition coming out of Stuart's work. Our mission at the Space Initiative is to create something of a next generation Starfleet Academy. If there's any Star Trek fans or science fiction fans in the audience. Except instead of just a Starfleet Academy for moonshots and star shots, can it be a Starfleet Academy for moonshots and Earth shots? Can we be both stewards of space and stewards of Earth? So some of the work that we do centers on democratizing access to space, on through rigorous research, prototyping the technologies of our sci-fi space future. One of the ways we describe it is if Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and NASA and ESA and others are working on the rockets to get us there, wherever there may be, Mars, Moon, and beyond, we are working on the human lived experience and maybe the robotic lived experience 
of space. What are the technologies, the experiences, and in a spirit of the whole Earth catalog, what are the tools of interplanetary civilization at that scale? And so one of the tools I'd like to talk to you about today, one of the technologies, as you see on the screen, is self-assembling space architecture. If you think about the International Space Station, as venerable and incredible a piece of architecture it is, it does not scale for the future of, as Jeff Bezos might say, millions of people living and working in orbit. What we need is modular, flexible, reconfigurable space architecture. So for example, maybe with tiles where you had a door yesterday, today you can have a window or an airlock or a docking port, and you can completely reconfigure this structure. So the way that this particular prototype works, and we're already testing it now, 32 different tiles, they comprise a Buckminster Fullerene, a geodesic dome, thinking about interesting and enlightening shapes to live in in orbit. These tiles are packed flat in a rocket, kind of like Ikea furniture. And then the idea is once they get to orbit through that rocket payload fairing, they're released. They elegantly and stochastically swirl around each other and self-assemble, click, 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 clicking into place. We use electromagnets, electropermanent magnets, and a supervisory sensing algorithm to say, hey, you know, if a bond happened that shouldn't have happened, this is how we reconfigure it, this is how we make ultimately the entire structure come together. Now, one of the motivations for this is to say, when we're in space, can we be thinking about living in not just tiny tin cans, but space cathedrals? What would it look like to live in something that Bucky Fuller would have wanted to design here on Earth, but have it out in space? as a point of inspiration for many of us as we think about humanity moving out as space tourists and beyond. Happy to say that this particular prototype has been tested on a zero gravity flight. We did not puke, although it's affectionately known as the vomit comet. And it'll be tested on a blue origin flight in the coming months and we're looking at an orbital de deployment. The reason that I titled this talk Bucky Fuller for Moonshots and Earthshots is that we're also thinking very passionately about how can the space technologies that we develop at MIT Media Lab come back down and benefit life on Earth and so one of the, the secondary advantages of this architecture is even though it works best when floating in zero gravity, it can also be used in resource-constrained environments on Earth as well. So quickly snapped together for refugee housing, for areas torn by natural disasters, for nomadic peoples. And it's one of the core themes that we like to keep in mind. As a final note, especially for this audience, I'd just like to say we don't explore space to abandon the Earth. And there are a lot of questions about why are we spending all of this money on space exploration when we have such critical pressing needs here at home for climate change. We don't explore space to abandon the Earth. If you think about the power and the beauty of that Earthrise image that Stuart popularized and made available to everyone, we had to go out into space and explore and be doing space exploration to be able to have that vantage point and that moment to take that image. And so I think one of the benefits of thinking about long-term space exploration is having the opportunity to venture out as a moment to also then take a perspective and look back on human society and what we would like the future of life on Earth and in space to be. Thank you so much. Just in general, wow. Uh, Neil Gershenfeld directs MIT's Center for Bits and Atoms where he's working on a Star Trek replicator. He's been called the intellectual father of the maker movement and has created a network of over 1,000 community fab labs. So my slide. Good, perfect. Um, this was, and this is, this was, this is, this is a religious moment. This was showing Ryan and Stuart my well-worn copy of the catalog uh, in the planning for this meeting. And at that moment, I realized my whole life course was set when I first encountered the catalog. A childhood friend, mother, was reading this big black book, and I asked what it was, and she said, what was the catalog? And then I asked what it sold, and she said, nothing. <laughs> and then I asked what was in it, and she said, access to tools and have spent the rest of my life trying to figure out what that meant. So, one Earth, which thanks to Stuart we have in this compelling image is, there are about a thousand cities, about a billion, about a million towns, about a billion people, and about a trillion things, okay? 
There was originally single mainframe computers. This was the whirlwind, the first real-time computer at MIT where modern operating systems came. That was commercialized as the PDP. There were thousands of them, roughly one per city. That's what made the well possible and the internet. Then came the hobbyist computers. There are millions of them. They weren't useful. You could originally just flip switches and watch lights blink, but it started the homebrew computer club. It started this company, Micro Dash Soft. They eventually removed the dash on that scale. Then came billions of PCs and then trillions of Internet of Things. So at the same time as the whirlwind at MIT in 1952 was the first real-time computer-controlled machining breaking this barrier to connect a computer to a machine to make something. That's where modern manufacturing came from. Uh, and my lab at MIT has the descendants of that tool, the million dollar tools. Actually, the, the second one of these is still at NASA Ames, down in the valley, if you ever go there. Um, the, inspired by the parallel with the mini computer that was used to create the internet and the well and video games and word processing, with a number of colleagues here, we started setting up these fab labs. They're like mini computers for fabrication. About $100,000 fills the room, but lets you make um, almost anything in them. And those have been spreading virally. It's like Moore's Law. They double every year and a half. We have them in Arctic villages, in African shanty towns, in rural India, all sharing technology to make almost anything. Um, that's thousands, but they're doubling every year and a half, so we're scaling to a million. So at the million stage, just like the hobbyist computers, just like the well moment, um, around here is Nadia, Jake, Elan, um, back there, Saul. They're a dream team of machine builders, and what they're showing here is not machines to make things. They're showing rapid prototyping of rapid prototyping, using the machines to make the machines. So if you want to participate, you don't get money and buy a machine, you go to one of these labs and make the next machine. So they're showing machines making machines exactly like the hobbyist computers. Then upstream from this in the lab at MIT, at the billion stage, we're working on assemblers that reduce all of technology to a small number of building parts to get rid of the supply chain. And then we're working on self-assemblers that get rid of the machine and merge the machine with the materials in this very deep way to make self-assembling systems. And so we're at a moment now where you can see, just like Moore's Law, the technology to go from one to a thousand, to a million, to a billion, to a trillion. That's here today, it's scaling just like Moore's Law. So to come back to why we're here today, we're at exactly the invent the internet moment in this history, but now for the physical world. So think about a well that goes from bits to atoms, a well in the physical world. Um, what it lets you do is an end run around some of the most serious issues today. So trade wars, income inequality, waste, all of that assumes that consumers consume, producers produce, you need jobs to get money to make products. But if anybody can make anything, you don't fight that through the front door, you just do an end run around it. So the, the, the emerging message is you can think globally, data can travel around the world, but you can fabricate locally. So domestically, there's legislation in the House and Senate by extreme red and extreme blue members together for universal access to digital fabrication like we have universal access to digital communication and computation. There's an initiative that started in Barcelona where they have great design sense but 50% youth unemployment to have the means to make as urban infrastructure. Cities all around the world have joined uh, Detroit, uh, Seoul, but Oakland is a leader in it. If you're interested, tomorrow there's a meeting on this Fab City commitment in Oakland on the means to make as part of urban infrastructure. So rather than getting jobs to get money, to get work, to buy something, you can just skip all of that and make something. And Oakland doesn't want to develop the West of the Bay did, but really reinvent what is work, what is money. Um, by going from digital to physical, getting over this notion of consumption. So finally, at this end point, I've reached the point, I think I now understand what access to tools mean. <laughs> and I would argue it's the single most important thing for the future of the planet. So thank you all, and thank you, Stuart. Okay. She's going to go get a charging port, but we're going to, we're going to charge ahead. Um, Carolyn Garcia, known as Mountain Girl, currently sits on the boards of the Rex Foundation and the Further Foundation, and is on the advisory board of the Marijuana Policy Project. 
She formerly served on the board of the Women's Visionary Council. She was, is, and will be a prankster and a badass. Thank you. So <clears throat> we're going to go back to when there was nothing. And after there was nothing, there was something. And the something took form in you know, the minds of folks who had been experimenting with psychedelic drugs. And that was uh, Ken Kesey and Stuart Brand and a host of other like-minded folks who have an undying curiosity about the universe and our existence in our amazing planet. And in 1966, it would have been about January 15th, there was an event planned in San Francisco right around the corner here at the old Longshoreman's Hall, which was a very modern building in its day, for its time, really. Um, so the merry band of pranksters and all of our associates uh, took, took flight from where we were hiding down on the peninsula and came up to San Francisco to bring our brand of weirdness to this festival that Stuart and his henchmen had put together. And it was really going to be the, the very first thing of its kind, because it was a collaboration of artists and techno folk and um, amazing weirdos from wherever he found them. And we were to make our experience, our, our, our whole um, appearance there was you know, it was a little loose. We didn't really know what ex exactly was supposed to happen or how we were supposed to be. And as we, as, as we brought in our stuff in parking in the parking lot and trying to bring in our stuff, we had these big painted boxes and all sorts of heavy things and cords and equipment that was already pretty tattered and broken from previous events. And who do we run into with the clipboard but our first view of Bill Graham? And Stuart has put him in charge of, of placing the artists in, in various areas of the, of the event. And a, a large argument ensued, of course, and a, and a confrontation, <laughs> because that's just the way things are. And um, we, 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 we brought our stuff in, and we got out our, our, our tapes and our tape recorders and our old film and set it all up. And um, we, were, we were told at the time that ticket sales weren't that great. And it was looking a little, mm, maybe this was going to make money and maybe it was going to really bomb. Because this is like two days before the opening. It was a Friday, Saturday, Sunday sort of thing. So after we fiddled around there, setting up our stuff on the balcony and listening to the boys turning on the Bukla box for the first time who were right next to us and they were, they finally got it. Oh boy, they said, it's finally working. And it goes, <laughs> just completely blasting eardrums on all sides of us. We're going, oh, we have to share it with these guys. So, so we, you know, we took a little break and we went to Stewart's for, for hot chocolate, ostensibly. And, um, <laughs> And um, Ken Kesey was, or we'd already been busted for marijuana a couple of times. So we had records, so we were a little edgy. And um, I think that the little, our little party out on, on uh, Stewart's rooftop attracted the wrong kind of attention. And Ken and I were up on the adjoining rooftop having a chat, and he was throwing pebbles from the roof across Vallejo to Margot St. James's yard. <laughs> where she had a toilet with nasturtiums growing out of it, which everybody in San Francisco had at that time. But hers was right close to the street, so we could plink it. But unfortunately, this attracted the wrong attention from the folks living below. And the cops came up. And Ken, having already been busted twice and had the riot act read to him, decided he was going to wrestle this policeman for the little tiny baggie of pot. And so we were busted and hauled off. And I remember looking back as we're hauled off in the cop car, and there's Stuart standing on his balcony. He's looking after us. And I'm going, oh, God, I wish I was back there. So, you know, tickets. The, well, the next morning when we came out, there was enormous publicity. Every newspaper had huge banner headlines about the, the, the rogue novelist and his girlfriend getting busted on the rooftop. And this, the, the event sold out immediately. LAUGHTER 
<laughs> so it was a huge success, and all the bands played, and everybody had an absolutely wonderful time. It was completely memorable, and and I, you know, I've lost count of how many people went there. But trips were the word after that. Trips was the thing, you know. That was, you know, the energy just kicked up like crazy in the Bay Area. And but unfortunately, poor Ken really didn't get away with much, so he he fled and went to Mexico. And that also pretending to commit suicide. Oh my God, the publicity! It was just ridiculous. And I had to go to court a few times, and Stuart supported me through that, and I could, I could crash at his house when I had to come up to San Francisco to have a court appearance. And I got off. And we all went to Mexico. We fled. We fled the, the terrible, terrible legal situation in the United States, which was so down on us, and became fugitives. But then we came back after six months. And where did we come to? Because we had to. We had to come to Stewart's next event, which was called Whatever It Is, and it was out at San Francisco State. And we drove and drove and drove and drove and drove in our old rattly, rattly bus and breaking axles and all of that sort of thing, and finally arrived about, about 20 minutes before showtime. Uh, and everything sort of went from there. Um, you know, Kesey immediately went over to the college radio station and made statements like, Oh God, I can't even remember what he said, but it was like really, really outrageous things about uh, J. Edgar Hoover can can kiss my ass kind of kind of things, and I dare you to try to catch me. And yeah, he was a little bit out of his mind. But every band in the Bay Area came to this thing. Every artist, every person. It was the beginning of a collaborative concept and consciousness here that I think has carried on into all of this. And you know, bless you, Stuart, for looking after me and taking care of us back so long ago. And it has all grown and become so beautiful. And we are all one with the world at this point. So thank you so much. And we all now have the power to think for ourselves. Thank you. I couldn't bring myself to hunk at Mountain Girl. <laughs> Bruce Sterling, second shortest uh, bio. Bruce Sterling, author, journalist, editor, and critic. He lives in Austin, Turin, and Belgrade. We're down to the low battery section here. <laughs> brought, brought some emergency chow here. What, what a beautiful crowd. You guys are the awesome. Yeah, hi, hi there, yeah, hi, wave. Yeah, so that, that was all true. Uh, I am Bruce Sterling, one of the very last editors of the Whole Earth Review. You know, and, and I did not volunteer for that post, ladies and gentlemen. I want you to know I was asked. It's like, so what are we gonna do? Like, the mag's out of money. Uh, well, how about Bruce Sterling? Bruce and his cyberpunk friends, they, they all think information wants to be free. <laughs> so they're sure to work for cheap. And, and by golly, we did. <laughs> you know, I, I did kill the magazine off, more or less, but I killed it under budget. I gotta tell you, me and my fellow travelers, we fell on that mag with glad cries of glee. It's like, are they still alive, Whole Earth Review? It's like, yeah, I gotta write for them. Yeah, let's go. So, you know, I didn't have to twist their arms. Uh, I probably couldn't have edited it twice. I like to ask for every favor I could get. Uh, and it was super fun. I mean, we just did everything. Let's change the iconic typeface, you know? Like, we, we know how to edit magazines now. It's great. We're Viridian bright green design enthusiasts. We could do cool digital stuff to the mag. So, you know, it was a growthful experience for me as an editor. Eventually, I married one of the contributors. That would be her there. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, if you're a futurist, uh, as I am, being a sci-fi writer and journalist and tech uh, tech follower type, uh, you look ahead a lot, and uh, eventually you find out you're mostly an undertaker. Really an undertaker a lot of the time, because that's the nature of the passage of time. 
Uh, and with enough long now ahead of you, you're really an undertaker all the time. I mean, eventually it all goes, right? Uh, things do indeed change. They're just, they change on like a Heraclitus level of universal transformation. And uh, when you can't imagine how things will change, that doesn't mean nothing will change. What that means is that things will change in ways you can't imagine. <laughs> Uh, so do I have my mag slide up? Do I have any slides? Do I got the last one? Okay, it doesn't matter. Um, uh, you know, I could manage without it. So when, when I think of my experience with Whole Earth, because I used to write for the mag, and you know, I would show up with the occasional article or review and so forth, um, I think of my life in a very different media world. I mean, a world that was really un, un, in great change while I was working with it and kind of visibly transforming. And you know, it was not the ideas or the drawings or the photographs in Whole Earth that were becoming obsolete. What was actually becoming obsolete was their physical means of production and distribution. And they just couldn't, couldn't last any more than one of my favorite toys of the period, the fax machine, could last. You know, and I think of the fax machine with great appreciation, not even sadness. Uh, this is an old and obsolete device. Uh, and I had a, 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 a unique historical experience with it. When it first showed up in my life, it was like super high tech, really faddish, an extremely out there device, squeaking, shrieking, emitting information. You know, a strange hybrid analog virtual gizmo that was like half paper and half data and, you know, and 90% phone noise. So, you know, I had, I had one, and, you know, I wished I had four. I mean, they were so much fun to mess with. You would not believe the punk mischief that I got up with my fax machine. I mean, I was super into it and really treating it as a kind of universal telephone pole where I could just, like, put Xeroxed data, you know, and, and it was anonymous, too, you know, because unless you wrote in who you were, nobody knew who you were behind this blizzard of off-the-wall fax interventions, right? And, and I was like, you know, I was a fax prankster, really, and, you know, and just up to, like, incredible off-the-wall kinds of, I don't know, mischief, like creative mischief. Um, and you know, it was a device that became futuristic and also like pitifully obsolete, comically obsolete within my own lifespan, right? Uh, and that was a historic experience. It was really a historical privilege. There were millions of fax machines. They were like a vast horde of bison. They like poured across entire continents and then vanished, you know, <laughs> just kind of gone. But, you know, I can tell you that if news arrived via my fax machine, my world, a news that could change my world, my world remained changed, even if the fax machine itself died and was no longer around. So, you know, the tale of the fax machine is a tale of technical mortality, uh, but it's not really a sad story. Uh, it's a phenomenon that deserves a cheerful epitaph, like a beautiful gravestone I once saw in Spain over the, the grave of a beloved woman, which read, do not grieve that she is gone, rejoice that she was ever among us. <laughs> a beautiful homage, you know, and I, I like its element of dark humor. Like, when you're a novelist, as I am, you realize that the human condition is tragic. I mean, you figure that out. And that maybe it's better never to have been born at all. I mean, maybe it's better never to have been a mortal human being. But ladies and gentlemen, who among you has that privilege? <laughs> Just two, maybe three, in this vast crowd. So thank you for your attention. And now, hog farmer, activist, humanist, clown, ice cream flavor, <laughs> wavy gravy. Lenny Bruce once told me that the microphone is your Stradivarius.
you have some gravy in your ear. <laughs> Wavy gravy, hippie icon, flower geezer, temple of accumulated error, a founder of Seva and Camp with a Rainbow. We led off with Larry Brilliant talking about the eradication of smallpox. I'll begin there. Let's hear it for the eradication of smallpox. Yay! So Larry returned to the University of Michigan where he's teaching public health. And who should show up but his boss in India, Nicole Grasset? He said, Larry, we must do something about this blindness. And so Larry, emptied out his Rolodex, and out popped me and my wife, Jahanara, and a bunch of other folks. And we all gathered in Heartlands, Michigan, in a place called Walden Woods, where we formed a nice circle trying to figure out what could we do to alleviate some of human suffering. Let's hear it for that, yay! <laughs> So Nicole pitched us about blindness, that 80% of the people in the world that are blind and uh, that uh, they could get their sight back with a simple cataract surgery that back then cost five bucks. And uh, today, five million cataract surgeries have transpired through SEVA. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but that was now and then. I was sent to try and pitch a rock band to do our first benefit. The rock band, of course, being the Grateful Dead. And I thought, oh my God, how am I gonna do that? So I went to the airport in Detroit and got on the plane, and who should be on the plane but the Grateful Dead. <laughs> they didn't have parachutes. <laughs> so I started with the drummers, and they concurred, and then I got to Jerry, and always the perfect gentleman, he said, might as well. <laughs> and by the time I got the, off the plane, I had secured the band and joined them at this uh, large venue in Oakland and uh, uh, was sitting uh, backstage while the band was playing and I'm getting uh, delightfully altered with Steve Parrish, Jerry's roadie, when who, who was in a rage earlier, why am I the last to find out about these things? God damn it, that's my Bill Graham imitation. <laughs> <laughs> who should show up but Bill Graham, who hands me a slip of paper, I unfold it, and it's a check for $10,000. My God, Bill, why are you doing this? Because you did not hit on me, my friend. <laughs> and so it came to pass, and so did it all. And five million people aren't bumping into shit, thank God. Thank you very much. Yay. Oh, 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 oh. A benefit for Save a Foundation, January 12th, Jackson Brown, Bonnie Raitt, the Fox Theater, see you there. A big thank you to all of our speakers. Round of applause for everyone. Way to go.